Song number 188. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings upon us. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today, to learn more about you. Just uh, pray a special blessing on Brother Leonard right now. Give him wisdom. Give him the words to speak. Give him clarity of mind. Help us to be attentive listeners and to allow you to speak to our lives. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thinking a bit about the message that you heard this morning on honor, it reminded me a couple of years ago I was at a, a uh, men's meeting <clears throat> and it's one of the speakers and all the speakers kind of stayed at the same home overnight and one morning at the breakfast table we were sitting there having a discussion. There was a young man probably in his low 20s that entered into the conversation with these older ministers. I was one of the young ministers. There was older ministers there. And he started interacting with these older ministers. And I couldn't believe it. He argued with them. I mean, I looked up to these older ministers as men who had wisdom. And I just wanted to sit at their feet. Here was this young fella, only in his low 20s. And he took them on. And he was arguing with them. I just couldn't believe it. I sat there in shock that he would have the audacity to just push his weight around like that. Later on the day, I approached him and I said, you know, I said, I just, I just can't believe the way you handled yourself among those older men. I said, it seemed like you had no respect. I said, a little bit of wisdom for you. I think you'd be much better off sitting there and listening and not talking so much. And he looked at me like, oh, I guess that's why God gave me two ears and one mouth. I said, yeah, you're probably right. But, uh, yeah, I just, that was, that was kind of uh, shocking to me that he didn't have enough of respect and honor that he could just try to take these older men of wisdom on and try to argue with them. It's quite something. So God give us wisdom in knowing how to honor those that God has put in our lives. So... <clears throat> I am going to take the liberty to switch the two messages around. Today we have, what is my place in the church? And then tomorrow, what is the church's place in my life? I would like to look at what is the church's place? What is the church's place in my life? I think it would be important to consider that first because we got to know what we're putting ourselves into if we're going to put ourselves into it. And so I'd like to talk a bit about church and what is church 
We're going to see if we can consider what is church. If I'm going to understand how to fit in the church, I need to understand what I am fitting into. I think we could probably have a lot of different concepts of what the church actually is and what it is about. But today we're going to consider what I think is the primary purpose of the church. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. And this will, we're not going to spend much time in this reading today, uh, more so tomorrow. Take our points out of this tomorrow. But we are reading in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So one of the things we see in this beginning verse here, 41, we see people who gladly received the word. The challenge comes to us. Do we gladly receive the word? Yes, Lord. I love your word. If you say it, I'll do it. And they were baptized. So we have them gladly receiving the word. We have them baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. There seems to be some kind of an organization here. Sometimes we're a little bit scared of organization. But I would like to consider that they were not afraid of putting their lot in. Did they call it membership? They may have called it accountability, but there was some kind of a solidifying of hearts together. So being born again, being baptized, being a part of the church. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we see a number of things here, and they spell doing church together. And that's going to be our emphasis today. What is the church's place in my life? It's about doing life together. No longer is it uh, you and you and you and you and you. It's us together. We are a community of believers Number of things we see here is fellowship. We see them breaking a bread. We see them praying together. They had all things common. They were of one accord in the temple. They were breaking bread from house to house. And they were eating their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That means they all did life the same way, they all thought the same way, they, they just, they were a community of believers that were doing life together. We want to consider today, what makes the church? So as you think of church, what makes the church? We can go around the country and we can see, view the expensive and massive buildings with stained glass windows, steeples on the top, beautiful artwork, and all the other things. And we conclude, or people conclude, that it has to do with the building. If I can go to that big church in town, it has the, the steeple on top, and it has beautiful artwork, and it has the... It's, it, there's, there's an experience you get 
by going to a church like that on a Sunday morning. And so they spent lots and lots of money on the building. Well, I think all of us would conclude that that is not really what church is about. It's not the building. It's not the fancy building. It's not that I walk into this fancy building and get some kind of an experience that carries me through the next week. For some of us, church is the Sunday morning church service. So we come to church and we gather in, we sit on our pew, the normal pew we always sit on. We sing the songs, we do the prayers, we hear the preaching of the word, and when it's all done, we walk out the back door, and we had our spiritual encounter for the week, we listen to some preaching, and now we're good. That's church. In that case, preaching of the scripture becomes the central theme. We meet Sunday mornings, and maybe if we're real spiritual, we meet Wednesday nights too. And somehow we convince ourselves that this is what church is all about. Well, I believe that that is definitely an important ingredient, coming to church and singing and praying and hearing the word preached. But I would like to introduce to you today that church is a whole lot more than that whole lot more than just preaching on a Sunday morning. The Anabaptists found a whole new meaning of church. They were a minority group that was chased and hunted down and had to hide. And so when they went to church, it wasn't in some fancy building with a steeple on top and stained glass windows and soft pews. They were hiding out in caves. They would hide out in caves and dens in the mountains, preaching and praying and exhorting and encourage one another. What made church to them was not only or necessarily the morning church worship, but it was rather the relationship of the believer. Now, the Sunday morning church worship and the fact that there itself it's about relationship. It's about community. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 11 to 22. Reading about the church here, Ephesians chapter 2. 11 to 22, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, you are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, that's the Jew and the Gentile, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And when he's talking about uh, the, the, the abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments is not talking about uh, the right things we can read about in the Old Testament. But it's dealing with the whole thing of the Jewish nation was called out as a special people. And Jesus coming into the world and dying, he has broken down that middle wall partition. Now, whether you're Jew or Gentile or whatever you are, you can come to Christ. It goes on in verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, 
are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We're not going to take a lot of time to dig around at all these concepts that are given here of the idea, this idea of community. We're doing life together. So those of you that are here at Concord or those of you that are here from Allen County, you're part of a community. And what we're emphasizing today is what you are committing yourself to and what is important for you to commit yourself to is a group of believers that are doing life together where you own each other. We're together in this. There is a big difference, by the way, between a pile of stones and a building. Just because you have a pile of stones all piled on top of each other with no organizations, that's not a building. There needs to be some very specific uh, order given to those stones. And once they're put into, the pile is put into some order, it becomes a building. Just as there is a basic distinction between a collection of parts and an automobile. Just because you have all the parts on a pile doesn't make it an automobile. There has to be some kind of an organization or an assembly to be an automobile. So, gathering all stones together in one place does not make a building, nor does getting all the parts together make a car. Some kind of purposeful assembly must occur before the one can become the other. So we don't just gather together on a Sunday morning, all come from our individual homes, and we come here and we sit on our individual pews, and we don't consider ourselves accountable to each other, and after the service is over, we hurry out the back door and we go for the rest of the week and do our own thing. That does not make church. No more does gathering a pile of fenders and bumpers and grills and engines and all that on a pile make an automobile. In 1537, Ulrich Statler said this, In brief, the word one or common builds the Lord house. The words one or common builds the Lord house, and it's pure. But mine, thine, his, or my own divides the Lord's house and is not pure. Are you getting the idea here? This is talking about doing life together, where I am a part of a bigger family. It's not just my family and his family and her family coming together on a Sunday morning, and then we go back home again, and we have his family, her family, and my family. This is where we consider ourselves to be a community together. What is mine is yours. If you hurt, I hurt. If you laugh, I laugh. We are together in this. And this carries through more than just the Sunday morning service. It means that in midweek, I may be praying for my brother or I may be praying for my sister and the Lord prompts me to call them. And how are you doing? I've been praying for you. I'm just wondering how you're doing. Or call them up and give them an encouragement. We're doing life together. It is more than just getting together two times a week. There's a big difference between a collection of believers and a church. Do we believe in community? So if we believe in community, that means a group's priority. A group's priority stands above one's own individual thinking. Now here's one with our Western thinking that's pretty far hard for us to get a hold of. But it isn't so much my idea as much as it's our idea. When we sit together, we make decisions. It's not my idea. And if it isn't my idea, then I don't accept it. But this is my brothers and my sisters. And so we are talking about this is our decision. It is a group 
mentality. When I make a decision, I'm thinking more than just about myself. I'm thinking of the group. If I make this decision, how will it affect those that I am a part of? We have so thoroughly taught that, hey, fathers, you're the leader of the home. You are the priest of your home, and you mean to make the decisions in your home. And we have fathers who are so strong that when it comes to church, they can hardly give just enough to be a community together. And I believe a father needs to make decisions in his home, and I think he needs to be the priest in his home, but he needs to remember, as he's making decisions, he is making decisions in light of the bigger group. So when I go to buy a car, I don't only think of how, what for car I want, and exactly what type and style and motor and all that. I think in line of, I'm a part of a community, and I am thinking within the bounds of that community. So I do consider what I'm buying, the vehicle I'm buying, how would my brothers and th sisters think about it? Because this is not about me. I'm a part of a group. I'm a part of a community. Okay, Jesus' family. Jesus actually taught allegiance to him to his family, to his, the, the apostles, the, the disciples. He taught allegiance to his family above one's own biological family. Do you get it? In the end, when you have to make a decision to, in following Jesus, you're part of a community and you're part of a, a body of believers and there's a decision made and your family says, no, you're not getting born again. You have a decision to make. And Jesus taught allegiance to his family over one's biological family. Now, that can really be taken. Uh, there was, there's this one group. They're very evangelistic and... I was preaching at a youth meeting, didn't realize it, but there was a youth sitting in that group who, where they live, she tended a market. And while she was at the market, this evangelistic group was trying to get her to leave her church, 16 years old, leave her church and go to their church. And so they use scriptures like, you know, you got to honor God over your parents. And they use all kinds of scriptures like that. And she had made up her mind that as soon as she turns 16, she's running away from home. She was just almost 16. And somehow they allowed her to come to this Bible school. And I taught, uh, I taught in that Bible school and she was convicted. And she went back home and she opened up to her parents. This other group were going to come into her parents' house at night, two cars. Someone was going to go and talk to the parents, and while they had, she was going to get out the window, jump in the other car, and they were going to go. It's not what we're talking about. I believe within the concept of community, there is that place of honor and respect. But Jesus did teach putting his family above one's own biological family. Much of the New Testament uses words like brother and family to describe the followers of Jesus. So we're here today and we're part, and maybe you're, you're a part of a family, but you, I, the concept we want to get a hold of today is that you're a part of a bigger family. Yes, you have your biological family, you have your parents, and it's responsible for you to honor and respect your parents. But if you're here today and you are born again and you're a member of the church, you have a bigger family that you're a part of. And just as you honor your father and mother, and that has its own respect, you also have a bigger family to honor and to respect. So how does this wash out? Three things. Number one, 
this concept of community calls a person, an individual, to put the concern, the honor, and the interest of the group above their own. So it's not about me, it's about us. Number two, community calls individuals to derive their identity within the group more than their personal identity. Who are you? Where do you come from? Here's my family, here's my church. That's who I am. I am identifying, I purposely do things to identify with this church. Number three, if we're going to be believe in community as Jesus taught it, we will have individuals seeing themselves responsible to the group for their actions. So no longer am I just an isolated island of my own. What I do affects the community. Affects the community. And Jesus, uh, Apostle Paul taught that in 1 Corinthians. He says, some of you are here taking communion and your heart is not right. And that for that reason, because some of you are not right with God, you're taking communion with sin in your life. There are sick people and weak people among you. So this community idea is that my actions affect the rest of you. Now, if we were to read Matthew 6, 9 to 13, it gives us the Lord's Prayer. And if you've ever noticed, it gives the prayer in its plurality. Our Father, our Father, why not my Father? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And it goes on in the plurality. I'm told it was a maxim of the Jews that a man should not pray alone, but join with the church. Now, he might be praying alone, but as he's praying in his mind, he is praying with the rest of his community, church. He was to, to but he joined with the church, by which they particularly meant that he should, whether alone or with the synagogue, use the plural number as comprehending all the followers of God. Hence they say, let none pray the short prayer. And the short prayer is, my father, in the singular. But the long prayer would be, plural in number. This prayer, the Lord's Prayer, was evidently made in a peculiar manner for the children of God, and hence we're taught to say, my Father, uh, not my Father, but our Father. The heart, says one, of a child of God is a brotherly heart in respect of all other Christians. It asks nothing in the spirit it asks nothing but in the spirit of unity, fellowship, and Christian charity, desiring that for its brethren which it desires for itself. So when you're praying, it is the right thing to do that what you're praying for yourself you're praying for all your brothers and sisters in Christ. You have just this, maybe not even a thought through, but it's just this idea, what I'm praying for myself, I am also praying for all my brothers and sisters. We're talking about community. We're talking about a group of people who are together, and they do not think only about themselves. They think in a group with a group mentality. They realize the things they do are going to affect the rest of the people among them. I remember of reading or hearing of a lady who was in her 80s, I think she was in her 80s, and she came to the minister one day and she said, 
I can tell you why your, the church here is having problems. She said, I've been living in sin for many, many years. I'm now ready to confess it. She knew that concept that if I got sin in my life, it's not going to just affect me. I'm a part of a body. I'm a part of a community. And thus, my actions affect the rest of the people I'm with. The beautiful thing is that I can pray and I can pray in the plural or I can play, pray with that attitude that what I want for myself, I want for the rest of my brothers and sisters. There's a beautiful uh, opportunity there in living in the plurality. Jesus came teaching this new concept of family and brother. We see it in his calling of his disciples, Matthew 4. And going from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left their ship and they followed their, uh, and they left their ship and their father and they followed Jesus. Now, we have to, I think it would be good for us to understand that this was a big deal. Back in these days, it was a big deal. Fathers trained their children and mentored their children in the same job that they had. And for Jesus to come there and say, Peter and John, come follow me. And for them to leave their nets, leave their boats, and leave their father's business was a big deal. That was not something small. Okay, I'm just wondering how much I should run after here, some of these verses. I think we'll move along here. We're slow to relinquish our individual rights. We're slow to relinquish our individual rights. But you know, the world actually, in some ways, have learned this one better than we have. Do you ever see the motorcycle gangsters? Some of those motorcycle gangsters that have, you know, things written on like uh, they just, you know, they'll have the name, what is one of the names? Children of Hell or something like that. Or angels. They have their different names. They have learned this concept of community probably better than the church has learned it. Again, they've learned that this is not about me as an individual. I am a part of this motorcycle gang and I'm proud to be a part of this motorcycle gang and I don't go by my individual name. I put on the back of my vest or my motorcycle coat the name of the gang. And so they're putting, they put ahead of their own the interest of the group. Their identity, who they are, is that standing within the motorcycle group. They see that what they do doesn't only affect them, but it affects all of the gang. And so they're very loyal to each other. It's something that we, as the church, have had a hard time doing. This community, community spirit, how does it look? There's no prejudice feelings like we like certain ones and we avoid others. You know, we don't, right? We don't believe in cliques. We don't have these two special friends and we just kind of shun everyone else. In Wisconsin, in the middle 1800s, in I think it was the Cheyenne Valley, which was in Vernon County. And I have a daughter that lives, if she's not in Vernon County, she's right next to Vernon County. But way back in the 1800s, the blacks and the whites lived together. It was largely unknown why. I mean, it, this was not a, how would you say it was not well known that in this community there was blacks and whites and they lived together as if they all belonged together. It was a small community. 
It wasn't, wasn't well known. Well, and why was that? Because they did not see themselves different. Everybody was concerned about his neighbor, whether you were black or whether you were white. One said it like this. We didn't even know we were integrated. We didn't, we didn't know that we were all just one. We just didn't care about color. Much of the history of the Cheyenne Valley community shows the people truly were colorblind when it came to work, worship, play, and marriage. And it is somewhat ironic that the dream that Martin Luther King Jr. had, if you're familiar with him, his idea was to take this stigma away between the blacks and the whites, and he worked hard and he lost his life for it. He was shot. That Long before this, this was already happening in Vernon County, Wisconsin, where you had black people and white people living together, marrying together, doing church together, and doing all of life together, and they truly weren't colorblind. I mean, they truly were colorblind. They didn't see necessarily or focus on the fact they were different color. Here's some things that someone said was unique about this community. These people lifted people up wherever and however. It was about other people. Focus on per a person's qualities and encourage them in it without overlooking their weak points. Just encourage one another, lifting each other up. Sure, we know that there, there was no generation gaps. They all just got along. The young, the old, together. Church should be that way. Young people, you should take a real interest in connecting with the older people. Men, older men, we need to take a real interest in connecting with the young people. In this community spirit, there is no generation gaps. We all interact, the old, the young, the big, the strong, the weak. We all interact together. When my children were just small, my oldest son, who is probably now 31 years old, 30 years old, whatever he is, when he was small, when he was about five, six years old, he was all excited about going to church. And it wasn't just to see his peers or his other little friends. Actually, his best friends were the moms and dads in the church. So he was making a card during the week. Leonard, who are you making that card for? I'm making it for sister so-and-so, or I'm making it for brother so-and-so. We're talking about community. We're talking about church where we do life together, and there's no generation gaps. We all get along from little to big. The older take interest in the younger. The younger take interest in the older. They mingle together, visit together, enjoy one another. This community spirit has a deep underlying respect from the young to the older. You know that in, uh, back in the days of the Old Testament that it was a, if you were a young man and you were sitting there and I come walking by, you would see me come walking, you would stand up and you would stay standing until I walk past you. If you read in Job, you will read that he complained that the young men don't even stand up when he walks by anymore. But that was very common. They were supposed to stand up to someone older and respect, show respect, and not sit down until they were passed. We're not asking you to do that. But again, it's that idea of respect. The older respecting the younger, the younger respecting the older. We're talking about community. We're talking about church. It's more than just going to this building that has a steeple and has stained wind, uh, wind, glass windows and it's some kind of an experience we get coming here on a Sunday morning. It's more than coming here and hearing the preaching and singing and praying together and then walking out the door and doing the, my life individually the rest of the week. We are living 24-7, seven days a week as a community. We're thinking about each other. We're praying for each other. I make decisions. I make it in light of the rest of the group. The community spirit requires involvement. When something is happening, when there's a gathering, everyone's there. 
The community spirit is one that supports the calls of the greater body. Community spirit is different than churches who violate family relationships. You know, this whole idea, you know, is the family accountable to the church? Is the church accountable to the family? Where, how does it all work? I know of churches where they will uh, go in if things aren't going well and they will separate the parents from the children or separate marriages and things. I tell you, we've got to be so careful with that. Churches have to be so careful. Families belong together. There may be a time for it, but I think we're too quick at taking children out of the homes because they're suffering a little bit or because they don't have a good relationship with mom and dad. When we're talking about community and we're talking about doing church together, we're not talking about, uh, okay, the church is so much important than the family and if we have to tear the family apart, big deal because we're a community and we're not talking about that. I would like to talk to you a little bit about community and what it calls us to. It calls us to sacrifice for the greater body. It was in a Japanese seashore village. A number of hundred years ago, there was an earthquake that startled the villagers one autumn evening. But, of course, being accustomed to earthquakes... They soon went back to their activities. But way above the village on a high plain was an old farmer. And he was watching from his house. And of course, when there is an earthquake, depends where the quake is, it can spurn a tsunami. He was an older man and he's seen it before. And after this earthquake, he didn't just go back and work. But he said... What about my people down in the village if this gives a tsunami? And, of course, he watched the ocean and he saw that the water was slowly going out. Going out, going out, going out. And so he knew a tsunami is coming. The old man knew what it meant and his only thought was to warn the people. He called his grandson, go get me the torch. Make haste in the field of rice, piled in stacks, ready for market. It was worth a fortune. The old man hurried with his torch, and he lighted those bales of cotton on fire. And as they started burning, the people down in the village saw the fire, and they rang the town bell, fire! And so everybody runs as fast as they go up the mountain, up to the plateau where this old man lived. When they got to the top of the cliff, hurrying, trying to save the crop of this rich neighbor, they said to one another, he's crazy. As they reached the plain, the old man said, folks, Look out across the ocean. At the edge of the horizon, they saw a long, lean, dim line, a line that thickened as they gazed. That line was the sea, rising like a high wall, coming swiftly. Then came a shock, heavier than thunder. That great swell struck the shore with a weight that sent a shudder through the hills, tore their homes to matchsticks. It drew back, roaring, then it struck again, and again, and again. Once more it struck and ebbed, then it returned to its place. On the plain, no word was spoken. Then the voice of the old man was heard saying gently, That's why I set my rice on fire. He stood there among them as the poorest of the poor. His wealth was all gone, but he saved over a hundred people. Community life means I'm going to sacrifice my life for the well-being of my brothers and sisters. A selfish life will let you feeling aloof from God 
and thus no assurance and could be the beginning of the end of your spirituality. Selfishness is a spiritual killer. In stories of survivors in the Nazi death camps, an attitude of determined giving was one of the things that distinguished the survivors from those who perished. If a prisoner was on the verge of starvation, but he had a crust of bread or a scrap of potato that he could share with his comrade in suffering, he was psychologically and spiritually capable of surviving. One survivor described it this way. In our group, we share everything. And the moment one of the group ate something without sharing it, we knew it was the beginning of the end for that person. A.W. Tozer said, the local church is a community of ransomed men and women, a minority group, a colony of heavenly souls dwelling apart on the earth, a division of soldiers on foreign soil, a band of reapers working under the direction of the Lord of the harvest, a flock of sheep following the good shepherd, a brotherhood of like-minded men, a visible representative of the invisible God. He further said, the Christian life begins with the individual. A soul has a saving encounter with God and the new life begins. Not all the pooled effects of any church can make a Christian out of a lost man. But once that great transaction has been made, the communion of believers will be found to be the best environment for the new life. Men are made for each other, and this is never more apparent than in the church. A.W. Tozer is just say, saying, the safest place for a new believer is to be plugged into a community of believers. And so, there would have been a time where I would have been fairly quick at helping someone get born again and baptizing them without seeing to it or discussing where are you going to plug into a church. Now, I have changed. I have not saw that come out well, where individuals get born again, they get saved, they get baptized, but they never plug into a church. And so, so today, I'm slow at doing that unless I know that that person has committed himself to joining, being a member, being accountable to the rest of the group to a group somewhere. So important. There was an article in the Reader's Digest that used the example of trees which depicts a spiritual lesson for the church. It says when the roots of different trees touch, there is a substance present that reduces the competition. I thought that's interesting. These different trees and different, there's a substance that helps them that uh, keeps it from being so competitive. In fact, this unknown fungus helps link roots of different trees, even of dissimilar species. A whole forest can be linked together if one tree gets sunshine, one water, one nutrient. The trees have a mean to share with one another. And so, like trees in a forest, we as Christians... A.W. Tozer also said the individual Christian will find in the communion of a local church the most perfect atmosphere for the fullest development of his spiritual life. There also he will find the best arena for the largest exercise of those gifts and powers with which God may have endowed him. The religious solitary, that's the religious person, who's living life alone, may have gained a few points, and he may escape some of the irritations of the crowd. But, A.W. Tozer said, he's a half man. 
Nevertheless, and worse, he is a half a Christian. Every solitary experience, if we would rely, realize its beneficial effects, should be followed immediately by return to our own company. Understand that there's a Japanese, what they call the Japanese honeybee, and the Japanese honeybee has a predator, a fearsome predator, and that is the giant Japanese hornet. And they tell me that the hornet will find the Japanese honeybee's hole. He'll go there and he will kill a bee and he will carry that bee back to his nest as a trophy to show all the other hornets that, hey, I found a honeybee nest and come with me. We're going to go and we're going to kill them all. So he takes more with him and he goes back to the honeybee nest. But the honeybees have learned the secret. And so when the hornets come back and they land on their hive or they land on the entrance of their hive, the couple of honeybees will come out and they will start making these really funny movements that irritates these hornets that were coming to kill them. And they get all mad and they go rushing right into the hive. And the honeybees, God-given, there's a thousand of them as a whole bunch in there just waiting. And as soon as those hornets come in, a whole group of them goes around and makes a ball. And the hornet is in the center. And then they start moving their bodies and their wings and it creates heat. The hornet can stand as high a heat as what the Japanese honeybee can. So this group with the hornet, and they make enough of heat that the hornet dies. I think that's pretty neat. But you know what it tells me? It tells me that the animals, these insects, have found better community than we as people have found. We need each other. We're not safe on our own. We need to do life together. I need to be a part of a group. I cannot afford to stand on the edge or sit on the back seat and kind of look at everybody else like I'm not a part of you. We need each other. We should be so committed to each other and to the group of believers that when I pray a prayer, I'm praying that prayer for more than just myself, but I'm praying it for my brothers and my sisters. What I want for me, I want for them also. Again, it's not about going to church on a Sunday morning because of the building and the expensive building. We might get a very little bit of enthusiasm out of that. It's not about coming to church on a Sunday morning only for the preaching and for the praying and for the singing. We're coming together because we're a community. We go back home again and we have the community in mind. And when I go out to shop for my clothing, I'm not going out there to shop for my clothing or to shop for material, to shop for my pants and my shirt with only me in mind. I am doing it with the honor of the group in mind. I will only do things in light of what the group stands for. And if we could really get that, if we could really get that, if we could lay down our pride, our individualism, that it's about me and it's not about the rest, if we could lay that all down, if we could look at ourselves as a community, I belong here. The young loves the old, the old love the young, they're together, we enjoy each other, we, there's no generation gap, we just enjoy the community. It's a whole lot more than just a Sunday morning service. We do life together. So just a few practical things. The decisions you make as an individual, you need to take consideration of the larger body. You're not an island. You're part of a community. What you do affects the rest of your community. If one part of the body hurts, the whole body is affected. Number two, 
this community idea, we need to live for the prosperity of the other. Romans 15, 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. It's about others. It's not about me. One of the things I enjoy doing is catching a young man or a father at the door, they're heading out of the church, and I say, okay, I want you to have a good week, but I think there's something you need to remember. I say, you remember that little thing, Jesus first, right? Yeah. Everyone else is next, right? Yeah. And who's last? Um, I guess me. I said, if you can live that out this week, you'll be in good hands. It's just a little, little, very simple thing. Jesus first, others next, ourselves last. We're putting the other above ourselves. Number three, share your gift. Be a builder in Romans 12. It says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that sheweth mercy with cheerfulness. We're all given gifts. We're not given all the gifts. Or we may be strong in some and weak in others. Our brothers and our sisters may be strong in the ones that we're weak in. We need each other. And Jesus has set it up that it's not us as individuals that give the clearest picture of Jesus Christ. It's us as a community. We give the clearest picture of Jesus Christ. Number four, in a community, if we're going to be a community, there needs to be a respect to those in authority. I'm not going to say much about that. We heard some about that this morning, but it simply says in Hebrews 13, 17, they then to have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Respect for authority. Number five. I think if this primarily goes to uh, us as leaders, but leaders need to make room in their hearts for the people they're serving. So, you know how the President of the United States is. If you want to send a letter to President Biden, there's probably very little chance you'll ever see that. He has it all set up that there's plenty of people under him that'll weed out everything that's unnecessary. Now, if you, for some reason, have a very important message, it might get to him. But that's not how we do church. We're in each other's lives. The leaders are in each other's lives. We're connected. We're a community. And so, please, don't look at us as leaders as we're up on some kind of pedestal where you can't relate to us. We're on the same level. We're a community. Do we have authority? Yes. Are you called to obey that authority? Definitely. But we're on the same level. Jesus said, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Whosoever shall be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Give his life a ransom for many. For a community to really work, we need to be at peace among ourselves. 1 Timothy 5.13, and to esteem them very highly. 1 Thessalonians 5.13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sakes and be at peace among yourselves. And today, I'm going to close with the plea that I want you to take this idea, young people, of community and that it is more than the church building, it's more than the Sunday morning worship, but we're talking about community. Jesus believes, uh, wants the church to be a community. He specifically gave us a prayer in the plurality, that what I'm praying for myself, I'm praying for everyone. He uses the terms of brothers and sisters, considering his own family above his, the biological family. And that as we do life together, that the things I do, the things I buy, the places I go, the people I see, everything that I do, I do with honor of the group that I'm in because my identity is not individual. It, my identity stands in the group 
I am a part of Harmony Christian Fellowship. And all my brothers and sisters there, I love them. I'm not ashamed to be identified as one of them. So whatever we do, word or do, deed, let's do it to the glory of God. And let's remember, we're accountable to God. We're accountable to each other. We're a community. And God help us to live like a community. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. What the church means to me. Oh God, help us to see it more than just a collection of people coming together. But help us to understand that there needs to be some kind of a assembly. Some kind of a putting together. And I pray that these dear young folks in their young lives could latch on to this principle of community in their brotherhoods, in their churches, and that they would see themselves accountable to the whole group, that they would lose their individual identity and be morphed into the bigger group, that you would bless them with uh, the grace to just be inclusive and be able to open up their hearts and their lives to each one, the older, the younger, and there would be that beautiful community spirit where we would truly be as that group there in Vernon County, Wisconsin, where they just loved each other. They didn't care about color. Help us, Lord. Thank you. Bless the rest of the remainder of this day. Each one of these young people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And thank you for that. How does the world know that we love God? By our love for the, one, by the, love for the brethren. So yes, our, uh, our love and our interaction and the way we treat one another is more so than just the honor that Jonah spoke about today, but it also is a testimony to the world of the love of God within our hearts. So uh, thank you for that. And um, I think we will have a short break. You will be dismissed until 3 o'clock, and then there will be singing practice. So.